My girlfriend kept giving me the same gift for five years now. She's furious that I finally walked away. I have always considered my girlfriend to be my soulmate. We have been together for five long and wonderful years, and I have loved every moment of it. There was just one reoccurring issue. She kept gifting me the same thing over and over again. At first, I didn't mind, but after a while, it started to feel repetitive and thoughtless. I love her but I just wish you would put a little more thought into the gifts she gives me. Who would have thought that something as trivial as gifts could cause such a huge rift between us? But it did. We had an incredible year with so many memories and a lot of plans we had made for the future. I dropped so many hints so she would know what she could get me because I thought maybe she just wasn't good at it. So I was determined to help her learn. Since we started dating, I never once gave her the same gift, except she asked for it. I always came up with something thoughtful, and for someone who loved receiving gifts, you would think that she knows how to pick gifts too. God knows I couldn't take one more watch as a present. Don't get me wrong, the watches were always elegant, but they were too predictable and I had grown tired of it. This year was the first time I intentionally threw hints at her for what I would like because I decided to take responsibility. I'll say things like I'll really like to have that, or this would fit me well, or I see this in my nearest future just so that she can catch my drift. I really hoped she got it this time. Sitting at the dinner table, I couldn't help but feel disappointed at seeing another beautiful watch. That was it. I couldn't take it anymore, so I decided it had become a problem we needed to talk about. I wanted to understand her thought process, because I don't think anyone likes to get the same gift every year. I scanned my mind for ways to bring this up without causing problems, but I realized I just had to say it. We needed to have an honest conversation, and that was what we would have. I was nervous, but I knew that if I didn't say something, I would end up holding on to this resentment forever. When I brought it up, she immediately became defensive. She told me that I was being ungrateful and that she put a lot of effort into finding the perfect gift for me, but I could tell from how she talked that she wasn't truly invested in finding a solution to our problem. The conversation quickly escalated. Before I knew it, we were shouting at each other. My girlfriend accused me of not appreciating her and I accused her of not putting any effort into our relationship. That's when she let it slip. She said, I only buy you the same thing because I know you like it, and it's easier for me. I was stunned. All these years I had been under the impression that she was just being lazy and thoughtless with her gift giving, but she was just trying to make things easier for herself. I felt like she had taken the last five years of our relationship and thrown them down the drain. It dawned on me that this was the same attitude she had with everything else that had to do with me. She did the barest minimum and made no effort at all. She already knew I loved her, so there was no point trying. Another thing that this scenario pointed out to me was the fact that she was selfish and I couldn't count on her. She only cared about what was best for her, and didn't have my interest or well-being at heart. Different other events came to my mind and they all seemed to have this theme. I remember she came by my house one time. I didn't have what she wanted to eat because I hadn't gone grocery shopping for the week, so I gave her my credit card to get whatever she wanted. She returned with some items to cook and noticed she had picked a rotten item, but instead of throwing it away she cooked with it. When the food was ready she served me very enthusiastically, and when I asked her why she wasn't eating, she said she was no longer hungry. That was surprising because she was the one who complained of being hungry. I probed and she finally said it was because she cooked with the rotten item and next thing she wanted to go home. I knew it was because she didn't want to eat the food and was very hungry so she wanted to go home to get something else. It dawned on me that just like this gift situation she was never going to have my best interest at heart. I loved her deeply and lately we have been speaking about getting married but I don't think I can do it. Marriage is a lifelong commitment, and if I commit to someone I need to be sure without any doubt that I can trust them and that they are committed to me in the same way if not more. I didn't see this for us no matter how much it hurt. This had to end. The next day when things had settled down a bit I asked that we go out and I broke things off with her. She pleaded with me and promised to do better but I couldn't accept it. It wasn't just the surface issues we were having. It was a sign of a deeper problem, and if we were not even married yet, and I couldn't trust her then there was no hope for our marriage. I told her I was sorry but I took my life seriously and with the turn of events I didn't consider us a good fit anymore. It was a difficult and emotional decision but I knew it was right for me. I needed someone who would love and respect me and make an effort to be considerate and thoughtful in our relationship. It had been two weeks since our breakup and most of my family members thought I was overreacting. I don't know what she told them. 
Frankly, I didn't care. I don't blame them, though, because they were expecting me to tell them we were getting married instead of that we had broken up. My mom asked me why I wanted to throw away a good five-year relationship. They didn't see all the things I saw and I was the one who would be married to her, not them, so I didn't let them sway me. It was my decision to make and not theirs. My mom was disappointed because she thought she was getting closer to having her grandkids. Even after I explained exactly what happened, she was still blinded by my ex's charm. It was as though she could do no wrong in her eyes. It is either that or she just wanted to manipulate me into getting married so she could have grandchildren. I decided that I wasn't going to let anyone pressure me into marriage. I know that the perfect woman for me is out there and I will do all I can to find her. Marriage is too important to make a mistake. I don't believe in divorce, so if I was going to marry, I had to make sure it was the right woman. I am a grow old with you kind of guy. Even after I explained to my whole family, they still wouldn't get off my back. My family is lovely, but the disadvantage of having a large family and being close to your extended family is that everyone is in everyone's business. Gosh, they were so nosy and according to them wanted to make sure I made the right choice. It was getting too much for me because I didn't want to break up. I mean, I love this girl and had invested five years into our relationship, meaning it was pretty serious. My family members were not helping matters and needed to get over her and move on. So I stopped entertaining any marriage conversations or anything that had to do with my ex until everyone got the memo. I was not a kid and didn't need their advice because I had made my choice and no one would make me change it. My ex has been going around spreading rumors that she was the one who broke up with me and I wasn't man enough. If she means I wasn't man enough to dump her sorry ass years ago, then yes. I ignored her because it was just her way of getting me to engage with her. My plan was to behave like she never existed, which I know would get on her nerves because she likes attention and doesn't like to be ignored. I planned to ignore her so much that she would even almost doubt her own existence. I thought we could go through this breakup like civilized adults, but that's not in her vocabulary. She was a drama queen. Now I'm wondering how I loved her and put up with her for so long. If we got married, I would have been in big trouble. My ex is very active on social media, so I didn't like how our private life was being put up for discussion and for people to make their own conclusions and comment. Some were very insensitive. The most annoying part was that she wasn't even telling the truth. When I first saw what she was saying about me, I took a screenshot of some of her texts, those pleading with me to make things work and some of my responses, and I saved them somewhere just in case something happened so I have my evidence. I even saved some of her voice notes. She probably thought she could lie because she knew I wouldn't go on social media battle with her. But at this point, I was rethinking it. What pushed me to the wall was when she brought my family into her little game and I was scared of commitment and a coward. This was the height of disrespect. If she left it between her and me, I wouldn't care, but now it had gotten out of hand, so I released all my evidence, including her voice notes, and said my side of the story and made sure to paint her very bad. I must admit I exaggerated most of the things I said, but it was still true, which was my revenge. I was the one with the proof. She had no proof and went about running her mouth. My post did what I expected. It silenced her for good. She was trying to grow her following so she could start being paid as an influencer so I'm not sure what impact this would have on her goals. All I cared about was to tell my truth. For all I know it may even help her. Good or bad publicity is still publicity. Ita, I was on your side until you exaggerated what happened. You could have just said it as is because now you are no longer innocent. Tanta serves your ex right. I don't get why people like to make themselves look like victims when they know that they are not. So I, 28 female, have an Instagram account that I used to use to post my artwork on. I managed to get a little over 35,000 followers at one point, but it has since dropped to 30,000 as it has been inactive for some time as a little over three years ago I lost interest in it. I haven't logged in for over two years. The issue is with my brothers, 29, girlfriend Katie, 26 who is a wannabe influencer. She has about 6,000 followers but acts like it's a lot more. It all started at our little sister's 11th birthday. I took a picture with my little sister and went to post her on my personal Instagram, which only has about 62 followers. Its account is private and my followers are all family and friends. Katie sees me and makes a comment about how I should build my brand more. My little sister, who dislikes Katie, was standing next to me, brought up my art account, and how I have more than Katie on it. Katie looked confused and asked what she meant, so I explained about my old art account. Katie asked to see it, so I show her the account. Katie gave me a weird look and walked away, and I thought that was that. The next day, she was over at my parents' again. She pulled me aside and starts asking about the account, 
namely how I managed to gain that following. I simply tell her the truth. I just started posting my art and people liked it and my followers grew over the span of five years. She asked why I stopped posting and I explained I lost interest. So then went on to say, well, if you're not using it, you should give it to someone who will. Confused, I ask what she means. She said I should give her the account so she can use it since I'm not, saying it's a waste to have the account just sitting there. I tell her no as I might want to start using it again someday. She gets mad and talks about how it's not fair how I have more followers than her on an account I don't use. She said since I'm not using it I'm being selfish and basically in lesser words demanded I give it to her. I again tell her no she can't have it and she gets mad and walks away. My brother calls me up later and tells me she had been complaining about me all day and he also asked me to give it to her. I tell him no and that they need to stop asking. My brother groans and repeats what Katie said. You're not even using it, why can't you just give it to her? I simply tell him no, it's my account whether I use it or not. He then accused me of doing this to pick on Katie, and also accused me of showing her the page to rub it in her face. He calls me the a hole for keeping the account when I know how much Katie wants to have a following. I told him that I made the account and built the following and I decided what to do with it. Now he's mad at me because Katie won't stop complaining and she's making his life hell. I now wonder if maybe I'm the a-hole here since as of now I have no plan to use the account and maybe I'm being selfish in keeping it. Ada for refusing to give my brother's girlfriend my abandoned Instagram account with 30,000 followers. Oh hell nah is Katie entitled to your Christmas present if it is something she really wants since like she learned that the thing in question existed and you might exchange it anyway. Why not your paycheck? Not like you use all of it anyway, right? If Katie thinks that her wanting something somehow warrants any sort of obligation on other people she needs to grow up and smell all the sand she's going to be told to go pound and your brother seriously needs to stop enabling that behavior. She wants a following. Okay, build one be interesting. Maybe she's lacking followers because her personality is about as interesting as wet newspaper from yesterday. To I don't think she's cut out to be an influencer. She can't even successfully influence you. The facts are your followers will ditch her once she reactivates the account and starts spamming them with content that is different from what they signed up for. Even though the account is inactive now you may want to reactivate it in the future. If she takes the account and pisses off your followers it will negatively affect your own reputation even if she's upfront about being a different person. I know we like to be anti-influencers on Reddit as if it's a fake job but it takes hard work to build up and retain a following in the face of constant competition and changing trends. Overnight followers are not the answer to Katie's problems. Continuing to do the things that netted her the first 6,000 on her own account are. My mother lives in South America and I live in the UK. I've lived here for almost 15 years. I married here and had two children. When I first got pregnant, I begged my mom to come and stay with me for a couple of weeks as I was going to give birth to my first child and her first child. We'd pay for her ticket, of course. But she said it wasn't her problem that I decided to have a baby on the other side of the world and she couldn't come anyway because she had work and studies. I sadly had a miscarriage last month and almost died from complications, hemorrhage severely, went into cardiac arrest and had to undergo emergency surgery to save my life. I was telling a friend from church about it later and how after a scary situation in life, even as a grown-up I still wished for a mommy cuddle. My friend called me a couple of days later and very kindly said she and her husband would like to pay for a ticket for my mom to come so we could spend the holidays together. I called my mom who told me her passport was expired and a new one will only be ready by mid-January. Oh, that kind of sucks I thought but I guess I can wait a bit more. But then she told me that she can only come in February after my sister's graduation. At this point I became so upset. I've lived here 15 years and not once did anyone bother to come and visit me. It's always my husband and I paying to go and see them at least once a year. They've always had each other for events like these. My parents were there for my sister's marriages, first births, holidays, when they're ill or going through hard times. I haven't had that and dealt with every difficult situation with only my husband by my side. I told her not to bother anymore and cancelled her ticket. Even almost dying is still not enough to get her to leave things for a while and come and stay with her eldest daughter for a few weeks. I'll spend the holidays with the only people who seem to care about me, my children and my husband. Ita. Guess I needed to vent a little. Thank you everyone so much for reading and responding to my post. I didn't expect this post to blow up like this. I think I'm ready to accept that my family moved on and I'm not exactly a priority. More of a second. 
Third thought. I did think that paying for a ticket, again, would have been enough for my mom to want to come visit, since all she needed to do was pack and drive the 20 minutes to the airport. Plus, as a South American, a trip to England is very much the trip of a lifetime. It's a sad realization that you're not as nearly as important to your family as you imagined, but I guess at least now I can move on. Thank you all so much for the good wishes, the lovely messages of encouragement and reality checks. I appreciate it. Happy holidays to all of you. Ta. There is very clear favoritism judging by how they treat your sister versus how they treat you. You have not seen them for nearly 15 years and you are simply showing them the same amount of contact they showed you. Tenta, your mom obviously could have visited you and has made the choice not to. All I want to say is that while you may not have any other family to rely on, you obviously have really great friends because not many people would hear about your struggles and then go to the action of giving you money to buy a plane ticket for your mother. So... If you have the energy, try and spend time with and build up your relationship with the good people you have around you and keep your family where they are, on the other side of the world. I'm sorry for your loss, and I hope you and your family are coping as best you can. I, male, 20, live with my parents and my brother Mike, 23, male. We live in a fairly decent home in a good neighborhood. Growing up, my father had an old-school approach to raising children. As kids, both I and my brother were subjected to reprimands, and if the situation necessitated beatings. He considered himself the best father and role model for his kids. But my mother is a lovely woman with a smile that never fades from her face. Talking to her after a stressful day always cheers me up. Though we were subjected to the same form of punishment as kids, he grew closer to our father while I found it difficult to maintain emotional intimacy with him. But mind you, I love my father with all my heart. It was just that I found it difficult to express it. Mike and I were very different. We had a love-hate relationship ever since childhood. It has not changed ever since. Mike was the golden child. In school, he was good at both sports and academics. I, on the other hand, was your average kid. I had severe asthma during my school days, so I had no interest in sports. I had a thin body frame. Nevertheless, I loved myself. On the outside, Mike always played the protective, loving elder brother to me. But this was not true. Ever since we were kids, he found a weird pleasure in framing me as the troubled kid in front of our parents. My father made a game of sorts before Christmas in 2008. He told us that he would keep scores on who was more mischievous till Christmas. For the one with the lowest score, Santa would get whatever he wished for as a Christmas gift. The mischievous one would get a sack of coal. Mike was ready to commit anything to be the good kid for Christmas. A series of incidents followed where my brother did something naughty and successfully framed it on me. First was a knee injury that he got during our daily cycle rides. He fell from the cycle and had a small wound on his knee. He was all right and continued riding our cycles. But as soon as he reached home, he started crying. He told our parents that I was trying to speed up and the injury happened when he tried to get to me on his cycle. He wanted to ask me to slow down. I was dumbfounded. But his crookedness came about when Dad started to shout at me. He requested Dad to forgive me and made me promise him that it won't happen again. This was always the pattern of how he framed me. In the end, he always emerged as my savior. I later realized that this was his way of earning my father's trust. At times, I used to cry and tell my mother about my innocence. Though she never saw it as anything above sibling rivalry, I was happy that she believed me. All these years later, the situation at home is the same. Mike spent most of his time with our father bonding over boxing, baseball, weightlifting. Dad rarely talked to me. I'm more attached to our mum. By the time he was in his late teenage years, we got on with our own lives. There wasn't much of a problem specifically because there wasn't much interaction. But two years back, I started dating a girl. As I mentioned already, I'm an introvert. She also prioritized her privacy. So we were dating in private. Only a few close friends knew about this. Though my brother had a popular run in school, he never had any meaningful relationships. He always wanted to fall in love with someone but he downplayed his desires by saying that girls are a major pain in the ass and dating distracts you from your goals. I and my girlfriend had a fairly decent run. We had similar interests and the same friend group. It was fun. One day Mike came to my room and started ranting about random stuff. This was odd. We rarely talked for the past couple of years and here he was trying to have a full-blown conversation, but I played along. The topic slowly moved to women and dating, and he asked me straight if I was dating someone. He had heard that I was dating a very gorgeous girl, his description, from a mutual friend and did not believe it. I told him the truth. He pushed me to show photos. After much persuasion, I gave in and showed a few selfies that we had. His face changed pale. 
I could sense that he couldn't digest the fact that someone found me attractive. That ended there. Later, a mutual friend revealed to me that Mike had forced him to share the socials of my girlfriend with him, just to get to know my little brother's girlfriend better, but I left it at that. My girlfriend had decided to move to another state to continue her education. We decided that it was not practical to continue dating long distance and ended it mutually. Around this time, I heard that my brother was going out with a girl. For the first couple of months, I thought he was making this up because nobody saw her and nobody knew who she was. But whenever Mike talked about this girl, he was head over heels for her. He asked me about my girlfriend. When I told him that we broke up, he told me that he was surprised I was alive. If it was him, he would have killed himself after a heartbreak. That is what love meant to him. He sounded hypocritical as this was the guy who advised me just a few months ago that women distracted men from their career goals. But I hated to engage in a debate with him and just nodded to everything he said. On a Friday, a message popped up on our family group chat. It was a selfie of Mike with his girlfriend. He said that dad had agreed to invite his girlfriend in for dinner the next day and would appreciate it if we were all present. I knew that the message was intended for me. I had no interest as I was aware of all the awkward and cringe conversations my brother would initiate. But on the brighter side, I saw that my father was being more liberal now. If five years back someone told me that my father would invite one of his son's girlfriends for dinner, I would have called them delusional. But that was happening now. So I decided to stay at home to witness it. Mike was over-enthusiastic and over-excited throughout the next day. He had a smirk on his face every time he looked at me. But I did not give it much heed. But I was anxious about how the dinner would go. My brother came home with his girlfriend later in the evening. Her name was Kathy. He introduced her to mom and dad first. Okay, a little bit about how I look. Though I have the body of a 19-year-old, my face still has baby features. But I hate it when people infantilize me. This is exactly what she did when I greeted her. She screamed out loud that I was such a cute baby and how old I was. Both dad and Mike laughed out loud at her pampering tone, but I felt disgusted. The moment she was in our home, she behaved in a very strange way. She commented on everything from the wall decor to the clothes I was wearing, but I noticed that she tried to please our father. There were a few paintings at our house that dad bought a few years ago. She was keen to appreciate them. When we sat down for dinner, she again ranted about the amount of food that I was taking in. She told the family that she was a dietitian and commented that if I had to man up like my brother and father, I had to eat more than that. She was constantly complimenting Mike the whole while. But it is when she started to target mom that I felt enraged. She commented about how my mom should take up new hobbies and come to community meetings like her mom. A thing to be noted here is that my mom has better educational qualifications than my dad, but she decided to stay at home to raise us. Though she never showed it outside, it is something that she regretted. So now Kathy was poking my mom at her sensitive spot. Suddenly my brother interrupted and said, you should start advising Jake. Perhaps then he will start working to find his own weed money instead of stealing from his brother. My head went dizzy immediately after hearing this. I looked at my dad. He was staring at me with his eyes that looked like craters from hell. My immediate response was to sheepishly laugh it off and then stare at my phone. I could hear Kathy in the background enlisting the impact of weed use. Now, to be honest, I don't have an opinion on whether weed is good or not, but one thing I'm sure about is that I have never spent a single dime on weed. In the next few minutes I could hear my father shouting at me because he took my brother's word as always. He was not even ready to hear a single word from my side. He wanted to raid my home. To add insult to my injury, my brother asked my father not to be too harsh on me as my girlfriend has recently left me. This caught my mom's attention. I used to share every incident in my life with my mom. She was surprised that I didn't share this with her. My father used this to further state that I could keep secrets from them, and my weed usage was one such secret. My father felt his integrity as a good father was being questioned. He felt ashamed in front of Kathy. She played along with Mike to suggest that there are facilities that treat addicts nowadays. I was sweating gallons and my clothes were blotched in perspiration. Verbal diarrhea by my dad reached an end when he demanded an inspection of my room. I said it was impossible to search my room. I have no idea why I got all the courage to resist my father's advancements, but I fought tooth and nail to resist him from searching my room. There was no reason for that, but I did. That's when he declared that either I can live at his house, adhering to his rules, or I can leave. His ultimatum knocked open something in me, some strange energy. I stood my ground and narrated all the injustices that I have suffered under him. He protested initially but then sat down to listen. I narrated events that I never thought I remembered or impacted me. I told him how much I felt left out while he was teaching Mike to box, weightlift, or play baseball. He once told me I was less of a man if I couldn't stand up to my bullies in school. 
Initially, I could hear my mom sobbing, but by the time I finished I could see that my father was in tears. I was determined to leave, but before I stormed out, I stood on the doorway and told Mike, I thought you would stop texting my ex once you got a girlfriend. My phone is, since then, being stormed with messages and texts from my brother and mother. No phone calls yet from the father. I had decided to go in low contact with my brother and father for the sake of my mental peace. Apparently, Mike wanted to propose to Kathy and already bought a ring. She playfully told him that she would say yes if Mike was cunning enough to kick me out of the house on their first family dinner together. She called it a prank or icebreaking session, but I could only see trauma in it. But my last rant about my childhood was so believable that Kathy believed the lie about Mike texting my ex-girlfriend. Only if I deny it will she talk to Mike again. I attended my mother's call who said that whether or not I clarified the thing with Mike and Kathy, I should call my dad and apologize to him. He has been so depressed ever since I left. Some mutual friends have guilt tripped me into thinking that I ruined the relationship. But what about my mental peace and years of being neglected? For years, I have taken initiative to fix everything, but now I'm tired. Am I the a-hole for not taking initiative to get back to my father and brother after everything they did to me? I stayed at my friend's place for a few days and then moved to a tiny shared apartment within the city that is affordable for me now. Today, Mike called. We were silent on the phone for a while. I was adamant that he should make the conversation. He told me that dad asked him not to step into his house until he brought me back with him. He was sobbing. My heart went out to him, but I made sure that I would take decisions only using my brain. He asked me whether I could talk to Kathy. I mentioned that I could. He requested I go home, but when I asked if he genuinely wants me there or wants me there so that he can return home as well, he fell silent. My answer was there. After the call I contacted Kathy to explain what happened, but she demanded that she wanted to talk to my ex-girlfriend to confirm. I denied this. Mom calls me every day. My dad always considered him one of the best dads, and he is shattered to learn how much he went wrong. But I was stern that I will return only after dad initiates a conversation with me. So after the end of the first month, I started taking therapy. Therapy has been very helpful for me to come out of the shadow of my brother and father. Yesterday on my walk back from work, I saw a familiar figure waiting for me near my apartment. It was my father. I felt a chill run down my spine. I invited him to my room. We didn't talk much about the incident at all. He initially said that my mom misses me. At some point, he added that he missed me as well. I started crying at that point. I sat close to him, and he put his arms around my shoulder. I don't think my father had ever done that before. I was healing inside. He cheered me after I finished sobbing. We sat there for some time chatting. He didn't force me to come home, but reminded me that I was welcome there any time. It took me 20 years to feel the warmth and love of my father. I'm yet to call my brother because I ruined his relationship, but I'm planning to call him soon so that we can have dinner together at home after many months. NTA, it took you years to acknowledge the problems that you were facing. The subtle things that may look like sibling rivalry can leave a lasting impact on the minds of people. Minor incidents in your childhood can have terrible long-term impacts on your adult life. It is important to address such issues. You needed to get closure from your father and brother. It might not have helped if you went behind them to seek an apology. It's best for you to wait. NTA. But I feel like it was unfair towards your ex-girlfriend to drag her name into your family issues. For context, I'm 29 male. My wife's 28, female. Family are wealthy. They also live in a cheap area, so their money tends to go even further than it would elsewhere. Wife and brother-in-law, 23, male, went to elite private schools, had three tropical holidays of luxury cars, bought for them at 18, etc. My wife and I live in a major city, whereas brother-in-law lives rurally, about 15 minutes from his parents. Brother-in-law is a small business owner. I gather he's decent at what he does, but he has been heavily bankrolled and supported by my father-in-law, who is retired, but works four to five days a week with brother-in-law for no compensation. Father-in-law gives brother-in-law his nominal share in the company outright. I've recently started a side business, which is doing quite well. I've got enough extra cash to treat my wife and I, and also look at some investment opportunities. This came up at a recently and brother-in-law suggested buying property to rent out. I had looked into this already, but ruled it out partly because the financial upside in our part of the world, current economic climate, didn't look to be great for the effort involved, and partly because I'm not morally comfortable with the idea of being a landlord. I'm not extreme in this view and think there is probably a place for private landlords, but it's something I'd avoid putting upon myself when I have better alternatives available. I explained all this, and brother-in-law essentially blew up. I had no idea, 
but apparently his whole end goal is to make enough money to buy enough rental properties to make that his full-time occupation. I said again that this was good for him if he could make it work. No skin off my nose, but he kept on his rant about how I was a privileged elite, city living, university degree, and an idiot for not properly taking care of his sister. I explained that we're more than comfortable as we are, and that my wife is both perfectly capable of looking after herself, and also makes all of these decisions jointly with me. At some point, I must have hit a nerve because he kept on with his tirade and started down the track of knowing the value of money and how my wife and I were morons for not going into the property. Admittedly, I snapped at that, and this is where I might be T.A. I told him that he has no idea of the value of money, that he's the product of immense privilege, has never paid his own bills, and only has a business because of daddy's input and bankrolling. At this point, my mother-in-law and father-in-law called time on dinner and suggested that we leave. We've never butted heads like that as a family before, so I think it came as a shock to everyone. My wife gets my point and is glad I stood up for her autonomy, but wishes I'd tried harder to keep the peace. She also says I pressed on brother-in-law's insecurities. Being a self-made businessman is his whole identity. So, a uh, I-T-A, N-T-A, brother-in-law kept pushing after you clearly wanted to drop the subject. Not only that, but by criticizing your lifestyle, he opened up his own for criticism in return. It sounds like the family is used to putting up with brother-in-law and his charades, and don't expect people to stand up for themselves against him, which would track based on him being the golden child. NTA. What's with all these wealthy babies claiming they're self-made? Are you actually self-made if your parents front you all the cash for your business? I don't think brother-in-law will ever change. In the future, if you have to be around him, I might just have a few lines ready to diffuse things. I'm not going to talk about that right now, or better when he says something nasty. What do you mean by that? Or, or just repeat back what he says. I hear that you are saying I am bad with money and a bad husband to your sister. Is that what you are saying? In best case scenario, he stops talking to you like that. Slightly less good scenario. He actually admits in front of everyone that he is insulting you, and you have ample reason to not be around him anymore. Next story, my older brother, 29M, has always has it easy and got way too comfortable in his situation. He was always the favorite compared to myself, 25F, and my sister, 32F, the handsome kid, popular in high school and with girls, that kind of thing. It seems during college he actually found a long-term girlfriend, and when he finished up school he married her. It's been six years since they married, and he hasn't done anything. His wife has always been a driven, successful woman. How he got her to marry him I will never know. Since they married he has not worked, they don't have kids, he barely does anything around the house. He works. He outright admits it. He has gained a considerable amount of weight. Developed a crippling porn addiction. He's way too open to admitting it. It's awkward. And spends his days with that or gaming. My brother got too used to gliding through life because he was always the pretty and fun guy. Now that he had his dream girl who provided for the house and brought in a ton of money without him having to lift a finger, he stopped trying to contribute at all. His wife works and does all the chores. They're roommates. I've always liked her and we hang out quiet a bit. About four years ago she started doing anything she could to fix the relationship, since of course my brother manipulated her into believing it was her fault. She tried to set up therapy appointments, go to the gym more, encouraging him to go to the gym, tried intimacy more often, cut back hours to spend more time with him, bought him expensive things. She spent years trying everything she could to fix things believing it was her fault. He didn't try a single thing, outright rejected therapy, mocked her weight even though she practically has a supermodel figure, insisted his weight was fine, refused to lift a finger for the house, and kept blaming her for the way things were, saying if she tried more he would be better. Three years later she was still coming home to him watching porn in a dirty house while she cooked and cleaned. Three years of her working herself to the bone only to come home to an emotionally abusive husband who beat her down while she tried everything to fix her marriage. Last year she decided she wanted a divorce. My brother became hostile and promised to drag it out and take as much as he could, as apparently that have a prenuptial that he somehow got her to agree to. I know very little about divorce laws, especially in our state, except for that we don't live in an at-fault state. But according to her, if she tried to go forward with it, and he got petty, he could take a lot from her. Everything they have is because of her. She decided against divorce. She was trapped with him and accepted it against mine and others' objections. I guess by then she was over his bullshit. She slowly spent more time away from home and claimed she was working extra hours. She didn't bother him about therapy or his weight. She actually pretty much stopped interacting with him. She didn't cook anymore. She didn't clean anymore. 
It didn't take long for her to admit to me she was spending quite a bit of time with other guys and girls. She never brought any home but was staying out late quite a bit. My brother didn't notice, and I didn't care. For years she was a beaten down shell trying to appease someone who didn't respect her. Now she was lively, happy, outgoing, and everything she used to be. I'm not happy about her feeling stuck with my brother or the concept of cheating in general, but apparently it works for her. It didn't take long for him to find out. Apparently there were a lot of people she was meeting. He was livid, demanded she stop, and threatened divorce. She didn't care. She told him he knew where the door was. It was her home solely and she was allowing him to stay out of obligation. She told him she would gladly stop if he agreed to a fair divorce without him fighting it, and that she was showing decency as a provider and a wife by not bringing her partners into their home. The thing is, even if my brother got his way in the divorce, he knew that money would not last at all, and without any work experience and the shape he was currently in, he would be screwed. He was an overweight slacker who barely had anything to his name. Prenup or not now, he was stuck. And so that's how it's been for nearly a year. She barely comes home anymore, and the list of APS has only gotten longer. My brother has tried going to the gym more, picking up a part-time job, cooking, but it's too late. He had years to fix this, and only chose to change when his back was against the wall. He's been begging me to make her stop and to give their marriage a shot. I told him he's a moron who only has himself to blame. If you beat down a patient and caring person long enough, they will absolutely mess you up. He needs to just accept a divorce in her favor and learn from this. He didn't like my answer at all and hasn't talked to me for a couple weeks. Myself, my wife and friends from college, including best friend and his wife, have been doing a college football pick'em league for the last 12 years. It's for fun, but I'd say most everyone takes it somewhat seriously. Since we've had the league different people won, but for six years in a row one particular guy kept winning. Each year, we have a big tailgate party at a game where the winner of the previous year is honored with a speech and trophy. Last year, we even arranged for a surprise cameo to be played at the tailgate for the guy who won his sixth in a row. I broke his streak last year and won the league, but I was also the person who typically got the trophy and arranged the cameo or some of the other cool things we've done. So yesterday was our big tailgate, and it was my chance at being recognized as the person who won the previous year. A few hours in, my wife had a few drinks and said, I don't even know what we're doing this year for, person who won six years in a row. And then I said that actually I had won, and her whole face changed. Our friend standing next to her turned white as a ghost. First they laughed, then said, no wait it was you. I realized that until that moment hadn't occurred to them, or anyone, to do anything. There was no trophy speech anything. My best friend quickly gets told by my wife that they forgot to do something and says nothing. Can't make eye contact, it's worse for me. After it sets in, I'm in the bathroom an hour later. I walk out, and some people start clapping, because my wife had awkwardly arranged for the crowd at the party to do something. I'm just sad. I don't really want to talk to my wife. She gave me a very short apology this morning and offered sex to cheer me up. Made it worse. Drove six hours home crying here and they're wondering how a group of people I love and care about would drop the ball. Sent a text out to some saying how shitty it was to be forgotten. Sucks. I'm sure tomorrow I'll be less sad. Relevant comments. Comment 1. You're the planner. You're the one that keeps people together and makes sure no one or thing is forgotten. So when you don't do all the work, no one else does. It's really crappy they forgot to celebrate your win. You deserved a hurrah and they let you down. Really sorry OP. Congrats. Comment 2. They did drop the ball and then handled it really inappropriately. Sincere apologies were needed ASAP and then making it up to you. I'd truly join another league just to take your mind off it and detach a little from that scene. Even if they don't do celebrations, you're the planner of the group that still isn't cool. I hate football, but this got me worked up. Comment 3. Everyone likes to accept rewards and praise, but not everyone likes to return the favor. OP went out of their way to make sure whoever won had a good time and felt special for six years and got nothing in return when it was his time to shine. And to top it off, his wife is trying to downplay it and act like he's overreacting. Feels bad. Least they could do is apologize, especially the MF, who laughed OP, is the one who made his win special in the first place. Comment 4. Next time your wife is upset, offer her sex to cheer her up. Comment 5. This isn't stupid at all. You're validated in feeling how you do, and it's shitty as fuck that your friends and wife didn't recognize how important this was to you. I totally get it. It isn't about fantasy football. It's the pretense of the entire situation. Honestly, if it were me, I would tell my friends via phone call or face to face, not text, and tell them how it made you feel unappreciated as a member of the friend group, as well as how it hurt how they reacted after realizing you were the winner. And not because it was over a game of fantasy football, but because this is clearly something you all put effort and emphasis into for multiple years, and there's no excuse for just brushing you off. I would also tell your wife how it made you feel with offering sex. Sex isn't something to be rewarded or withheld, and that set off smoke alarm bells for me personally. You deserve to be surrounded by people who appreciate you the same way you do for them. This isn't something to accept, it's important that you say something. 
I know it's uncomfy, but it's worth it. Sending you love, OP, thank you very much, really. I teared up that anyone felt sympathetic, I'm in my house and feel like I'm on an island by myself. Update, it's tomorrow, after a night where I slept in the guest bedroom. Late last night I got an email apology from the girl who turned white when she found out. My wife woke up at 6 to get ready for work, and I was up helping kids get ready for school. She wanted to talk, and asked if I could talk also. I was half awake, and didn't have any thoughts put together. The first thing she says is that I need to keep perspective. She said that it's not as if she cheated on me, she forgot something big but there are much worse things that could have happened. I didn't respond. She asked how long she was going to be punished for this, and I just responded by saying it wasn't all about her. She is visibly frustrated, and I'm too afraid to say something that will ignite her. I feel like she's desperate for me to say anything. I realize she's not comforting me, or trying to understand, she wants full resolution before we have to take kids trick, or treating tonight. That's it for now. She texted good morning, and I haven't responded. Relevant comments comment 1. When the planner doesn't plan, shit doesn't get done. I am sorry that your lame-ass friends didn't treat you well by remembering to celebrate your win. I'm even more sorry that none of them had the guts to come clean and apologize in front of the group for being such a shitty friend. And finally, to the guy that laughed, and who no one shut down when he was please accept my two-finger salute over the internet. Now that I've established that I'm firmly on your side, I ask you, what do you want to have happen now? Think long and hard about what it is that you want. Yes, this whole fantasy football thing is shitty, but what sort of friends are these guys outside of this situation? Would you call them if you needed help moving, and would they come? If you suffered a real tragedy, would any of them be another shoulder to cry on? If you have kids, or were to have kids in the future, would you invite these people to be a part of your child's life? If these people are merely the college fantasy football bros, then maybe you need to consider letting them all go. You've devoted considerable time and effort, and maybe money, into making these events fun for them, but when the time came for them to return the favor, they didn't care enough to get the job done. I don't blame them for not being more sincere in their apologies on the day this all went down. By your account, they were all caught flat-footed and it's hard for most of us to admit our mistakes and apologize properly when we're still processing what an asshole we've been. Have any of them reached out since? Only you can decide how much these people mean to you and whether you want them in your life going forward. If I were you, I would write a huge screed about everything I'd done for the group over the past years, trying to make this event a yearly spectacle. I wouldn't cuss or throw around insults, but I would make it very clear to everyone that this event is so much fun every year because of my hard work. Then I'd end it with how disappointed I was that none of them saw fit to return the favor when I was the winner. I would absolutely point out that the previous winner laughed and was a complete jerk, and that it was shitty of them not to shut that noise down, but I'm petty like that. Maybe you're not that petty. I'd fire this off into the group chat, or whatever you guys used to communicate, and see what happens. Maybe you'll get a ton of heartfelt apologies, and they'll plan an extravaganza in your honor, and all will be well. Or maybe you'll get back a bunch of hate and you'll see their true colors. Either way, you'll have your answer as to what sort of friends they really are. Once you've sorted the friend situation, you'll need to sort things with your wife. I have a lot of questions for her, and I imagine you do too. Why didn't she organize something to celebrate your win? For starters, the wife might be something that requires marriage counseling, but only you two can determine that at. EP, I don't know. I don't want anything. As of this morning, I'm just wanting to not have this tension with my wife. But I'm kind of stuck on feeling let down and she's supposed to be the person that doesn't do that. Comment 2. Is your wife always as shitty as she seems here? OP. No, she's great and a wonderful partner. But one major part of her personality is that she hates any feeling of having done something wrong. It's like she becomes a different person. Comment 3. So, bad sex and a weak apology is how she makes up for it. Comment 4. And then getting upset at OP for feeling hurt and making it about herself. Now to the next story, story 2. I'm leaving my boyfriend after two years together because of his prenup demands. Why I chose to walk away from a relationship that felt one-sided. I'm 34F, breaking up with my boyfriend 34M because of a prenup I've been with my boyfriend for about two years. Everything is going well and we love each other. We've been discussing marriage and he mentioned he would not marry me without a prenup. We discussed this in detail and I did not like what he proposed. His family owns a lot of property land and has lots of savings. After marriage, he wants me to move into one of the houses his parents own. I told him I'm uncomfortable building a life and a family in a house I have no ownership in, and he didn't understand. I told him I'd prefer to rent a place together, or we can live temporarily in one of his parents' houses and look at property together, but he refused. He said he liked the houses his parents and he already owned. He said he would not buy other property. He said he would not sell any of his property to buy one with me. He told me if I wanted to own property, I could save up money by living in one of these properties and invest in one myself. Problem is, he would be entitled to half if we divorce since my purchase would happen after marriage. He told me I could pay his parents' rent if I feel like I don't belong on the property. He told me I could buy half of the house we live in from his parents. Problem is, I don't like the houses that him or his parents own. They also have a lot of stuff and I feel like there's no space for me. I want to look at houses, 
I want to pick the place I live in, and I want to do it with my partner. I've made this clear to him over and over, but he won't budge. He earns more than me, and he has more assets than me for sure. He made it clear he was afraid I was a gold digger, and he wanted to protect himself and his family's assets from me, which I can understand. This whole thing has made me feel very weird. This topic has come up before, and it has always made me feel very small. It makes me feel like all he cares about are his assets. It makes me feel like he wants me as long as I fit into the life he already built and doesn't care to build one with me. It makes me feel like a gold digger. He has enough money to retire right now and live comfortably. I don't. He basically told me that whatever money he earns now, he can spend so he won't be investing in too much anymore. He expects our earnings and our savings after marriage to be split, which I feel off about. I'm sure this is normal for some people. I'm sure other people would be happy to be with someone who is well off. I am not. I want someone beside me building a life with me, not someone who has built a life with his parents and wants me as long as I behave and fits into his life, which is how he's been making me feel. So, I'm leaving him. I welcome opinions on this. But, yeah, it's been too long that this has made me feel off about our relationship. I'm protecting my peace and leaving him with all his houses and money. Tolger, BF and I are talking about marriage, boyfriend and his family are well off. He wants me to live in a house I don't own and doesn't want to look at houses with me. I wants half of post prenup assets. So I'm leaving. Relevant comments. OP adds context to the prenup talk during their relationship. No. He mentioned prenups very early and I would keep asking him about the details, but he would keep it very vague and assure me we would work it out when the time came. I never asked him about his assets and I never actually knew how much assets his family had. The only things I knew were from some of his one-off comments about certain assets. If he mentioned this tenant or that tenant or this thing they have to repair etc. etc. I had also initiated these conversations. He mentioned wanting to live with me and work towards marriage. I figured then that time had come. This is when I sat him down and asked him what he expected from me, what he wanted, and to clarify the conditions of any prenups he wanted to propose, he still tried to dodge my inquiry. It took so long for me to pull this information out of him. I guess I did wait two years, but marriage talk seemed like the right time to push him to discuss it. Update, so many things have happened. This is a bit of a rant, and I know I'm missing parts, but I'll try to cover the important bits. Before I start, here's some important context. I have a stable and rewarding career, and though I don't earn as much as him, I am very happy with what I can afford. My parents have always taught me that women should be independent, and I've taken that to heart. I live below my means, which has allowed me to put money aside for savings and investments. A lot of comments have mentioned that I should take the free rent, and that it would somehow set me forward in life, but for me, giving up my sense of autonomy and control over my home, my safe space, is not worth the potential savings. I lived with my parents and saved aggressively until I was 30, so I am lucky enough to be in a position where I can comfortably afford rent or a mortgage by myself. Plus, he expected the living situation to be permanent. I would not move into a house owned by someone else just to save on rent. Would it be nice to save $2,000 a month? Sure, but most people pay rent, and I am not an exception. If I really wanted that, I could move back in with my parents. But again, autonomy is very important to me. Also, if he's this stubborn now, I don't see how this situation could be improved later after I already moved in. I could also counter the prenup and make it so all my accumulated assets stay mine, or put in a clause that I'll be compensated for any children we have, or put that I'd get a limoni, or at least have a roof over my head in case we divorce. But for me, that feels overly transactional. It also gives me the vibes that I'm going to be living with a roommate who I sleep with and might have babies with, not a partner. I prefer to feel like we're in it together. He can keep what was his, but I want to build up what is ours. Also, if everything is completely split, it'll open up a new can of worms. How will our expenses be split if I'm working and he's just chilling? What happens when we have children? He has money saved for them, but will I get a say in how we spend that money? I know these can be worked out, but this is not the type of marriage I want. I can't predict everything that will happen, and I don't think I can capture it in a contract. And it's already been so heartbreaking for me, I don't want to go through more. Anyways, yada yada yada. I'll just say that it felt like I was being stripped of my autonomy, stonewalled and treated like a hostile. Okay, on to updates. So I told him I needed to end this relationship. I appreciated and truly enjoyed my time with him but our financial values and the preferred married lifestyle just don't match. It was a quick and easy conversation fee. I expected the breakup to be a bit of a process, not a one and done thing, since our lives overlap a lot. I'm also in contact with a lot of his family, so awk, during this whole time, a lot of them got involved, but blah blah, not super relevant to updates, talk with his parents. Okay I love his parents. I had a great relationship with them. I would go over to their house, we would have food, chat, watch teeth, Sometimes I would go to the parties they host without my ex if he was busy. A few days after my talk with my ex, I went over to say goodbye. I didn't know if the prenup was family enforced or not, so I kept it very general and mainly focused on how the situation made me feel and what I was looking for in a relationship. His parents were shocked when I told them why I was leaving. I'm going to bullet point the rest. His parents really want grandbabies, 
However, my ex's younger brother and Sel do not want kids. They were so happy when I came into their lives and she found out I wanted kids. His parents had created their wealth together, with his dad being the major breadwinner for most of the relationship. His mom was shocked at what he was offering me, saying these aren't the values he was raised with. She had been effectively retired since almost 15 years ago, and she said ex's dad never made her feel uncomfortable because of the difference in earning potential. They told me that they built their assets for themselves and their children. They said that includes whoever their children decided to share their lives with they have many properties. However, they also have enough investments that they can live off of those. They told me their plan was to sign over a house of our choosing as a wedding gift or sell a house and give us cash so we could buy a house we both wanted. As they got older, they planned to evenly divide their properties between my ex and his brother since they wouldn't want to manage the properties anymore and live off investments. Ex's mom said she would have made sure my name was on my ex's portion especially since we were wanting kids. They mentioned investments will go directly into funds for grandkids after their passing. Maybe this is what my ex was referring to when he said his children would be set. Bit morbid though. Ex's mom told me that the mother of her grandbabies would be taken care of, and she wanted us to be on equal footing while raising a family. TBH, this conversation was kind of like a weight off my chest. I always loved his family and never felt excluded, but the prenup talks left me confused and hurt. What they said fit with what I knew from my ex and them before. I'd be lying if I said I didn't start imagining this life I talked to my ex again. I'll bullet point this too. Basically he told me his dad had joked before about how he hoped him and his brother would not find gold diggers. And that's where that comment came from. He felt responsibility to protect his parents' assets, since he didn't feel entitled to them. So by extension, I wasn't entitled either. In his culture, sons carry on the family line, so he felt he had to keep his assets in the family line, which I'm not part of, but any sons we had would be. Most of the assets he's worried about are under his parents' name, and he had never asked for their opinion on what to do. He just did what he thought he should be. He also said he isn't that well off, and that his assets shouldn't come between us. This is still confusing to me. Isn't this whole thing because he was well off, and wanted to hold on to what he had and not create a shared lifestyle? I think maybe he meant he didn't own much, and most things actually were under his parents' name. He felt he was punching above his weight with me, and was scared I would leave him. He was afraid I was with him because of his finances, since that was the only thing he had more of, whereas he said I am intelligent, hardworking, beautiful, blah blah. He was scared about moving forward with the relationship, but instead of communicating, he became defensive. To me, it seems like he said and did things because he was feeling deeply insecure. He had made a couple passing comments before about me being more beautiful than him, or how I'm more hardworking at Setsrec, but I had always taken them as compliments, not self-deprecating comments towards himself. He's such a caring, funny, and intelligent person, just in a different way than me. Also, I know he's not as confident as he comes across, but I had no idea that his insecurities ran this deep. He also apologized over and over about how he didn't mean to make me feel like an outsider to him and his parents, and insisted that he wanted to share a life with me. So he said his insecurities and fear got the best of him, and he didn't handle it well. He had taken advantage of my patience and lashed out because he felt inadequate and scared. It broke my heart because I think all this could have been avoided. We've been through this song and dance before many times, where he would feel some sort of way, then act out as he's processing it. Until now, I always stay through it and we move on but it's never gone on for so long. But I guess the issues we faced before were smaller compared to mapping out our whole lives. I've pushed him to seek individual counseling, and we've attended couples counseling together, but I can't force him to sit and identify his emotions or employ the tools we were taught. The prenup conversation happened over a long period of time. He had so many chances to pump the brakes and reflect on what he was saying, and simply just tilled listen tilled to me. But he didn't. He then sat in front of me saying that everything he said before was not what he meant. He said he would be happy to take care of me and our future kids, we could buy a house together, or rent if I wanted to, because now he wasn't scared about creating a life together, completely opposite to everything he had been saying. But how unsettling is it that he seems so completely comfortable and confident in the hurtful words he previously said, and was okay with placing me in a very unequal position in the relationship, despite me continuously trying to articulate what I wanted, and how he was making me feel, he didn't even consider my side, over months. I know I have a good deal, with what his parents are offering, and I know him and I get along super well, but I'm not marrying his parents. I can't have his mom with us during every arg argument or life decision we take. Thinking back I can count on one hand where we've run into issues, and he was able to address it without acting up. He's such a nice guy, but I can't be his garbage bin every time he needs to sort out his feelings. It's already worn me down. He's a grown man, he's intelligent and intuitive. He's had two years to learn how to communicate with me, and he's not. I honestly can't tell if what he said to me is genuine, or coming from his parents, or coming from a fear of losing me. I could give him the benefit of the doubt again and move forward with the relationship, as I've done in the past. But, I'm tired. I think this is a fixable problem, but I also have not seen any improvement since we started dating. If anything, this prolonged experience has made me feel it's gotten worse. 
I will not make the mistake of investing in a man because of what he could be, instead of who he is. If the last few months are a testament to how he handles stressful situations, I can only take things as they are, and assume they won't change. This whole thing has left me sour. I don't need too much, but I do expect to be treated with love and support, even during times of disagreement. I cannot just forget the feelings and words I've felt and heard over the last couple of months. I can't just unhear and unknow that he is afraid I'm a gold digger. That was just one of many comments that really hurt me. I think life will have a lot more ups and downs, and I cannot imagine what kind of difficulties we will face if this is how we communicate, even after identifying it and working on it in therapy. For these reasons, I'm still choosing to walk away. Very diff from leaving because of a prenup, but it is leaving nonetheless. And T, this hurts more. I know it will hurt for a while, but I pray I'll be avoiding heart and complications in the future. Who knows? If it was meant to be, maybe we'll find our way back. For now I've told him and his family I need space and time. I know that it seems like I'm giving up a lot, but, oh see there are things I can't put in a post. I actually wrote the above quite early, but I didn't post because it didn't feel like it was over. But now after this time, I know it is. It's been tough, and it's only been a couple months, but I'm sure I made the call. It's tough watching everyone coupled up and having children, but it is what it is. I'm proud of myself for leaving and I'm slowly healing. I discovered my STBXW cheating about seven months ago. I went through all the heartache, the denial, the pain, the pick-me attempts. I was seriously depressed for a long while. I never confronted her, but I was a total mess. She must have known I knew. She just didn't care, I guess, or at least I assume that. About two to three months ago, I was just done with it all. Done with her. Done with the marriage. I just didn't care anymore. I completely checked out of the relationship and started preparing for divorce and my new life to come. I avoided my wife as much as possible. I tried to stay out of the house when she was home. I would not engage in conversation. When she asked me a question I would only answer yes, no, or maybe, or I don't know. I even left the divorce lawyer's bills out in the open. She must have known I was checked out and preparing to divorce. Kids even asked me about it. Even they could see what was going on. I even did the, we both love you speech. It's not your fault sometimes grown-ups can't be together anymore, Itecha. My wife was actually in the room and must have heard me talk to the kids. She didn't comment or object. I took her silence as consent. Anyways, a few days ago I met a girl I used to know in school before I ever met my wife. We always had this tension between us, some kind of chemistry. We would always flirt and be touchy, but we never actually did anything about it. Let's call her Monica. Because I think she, she looks like Monica Bellucci. Monica and her family moved away before I found the guts actually do anything about it. I regretted that for a long time, but I was young, shy, and stupid. I haven't been thinking about Monica for a long time, actually. I haven't seen her for years, but as soon we met, the tension between us was palpable. Even more than I remember, and communication was effortless. She actually asked me out. I explained the situation to her with my STBXWXW. I told her I wanted to be officially separated before I started dating. I wasn't going to cheat. Monica respected that. She gave me her number and told me to give her a call as soon as I was done doing what I had to do. She told me she never married and she was really excited to get to know me again. I was even more excited. The encounter motivated me to finally confront my wife and officially get separation and divorce going. I was really happy when I went home and sat down waiting for my wife. I was actually grinning like a lunatic when I asked her to sit down and told her that we had to talk. I told her I've known about her cheating for a long time. I told her I assumed that she knew I knew especially since I checked out of our relationship for the last three-ish months. She didn't seem to mind that I no longer care. So, I told her I want to start dating and get on with my life. I concluded my speech with, all taken into consideration, it's time for us to get divorced, don't you agree? Her reaction was totally not what I expected. She started crying, not just regular crying either. Like a desperate soul-breaking noise, I have never heard anything like it. She was blabbering excuses, asking for second chances, that the affair didn't mean anything. But we could fix this if we try counseling. I was a bit shocked I thought she would be happy. I told her she could go and be with this guy without guilt. He is obviously more important to her than her family. If he wasn't, why go with him in the first place? She must have known this would destroy us. She can't possibly be that stupid, can she? I told her if she believed we needed fix our family or our marriage, the time to do that would have been seven months ago before she had the affair. Now it's too late, it's broken beyond repair. I didn't think we had any problems in our marriage, she didn't talk to me, and I am not a mind reader, so whatever it was I had no way of fixing it. Since she started this affair with the other guy she obviously thought something was wrong or missing. Something that was so wrong that it couldn't be solved by talking to me. Something had to be so lacking or so wrong that she was okay with having our children grow up and are broken from there on in? 
If not, why do it? I clearly and calmly explained that there is no way for her to you this guy for the last seven months, and there is no way to undo the pain and suffering she caused me. The pain she caused that made me arrived at this point of basically being indifferent. Or actually, I kind of hate her guts. I'm simply being civil for the sake of being able to co-parent our children in the future. I told her I didn't believe she ever cared about me. No person that cared even a little for someone else would put them through this kind of pain. They would not betray them in such a way that she had done. Her telling me that she loves me has no meaning or credibility, because her actions conclusively prove otherwise. She became completely incoherent at this point. I could not make heads or tails of anything she said. It's just a jumbled mess. In the end, I had to call her sister. Because honestly, I wasn't going to take care of her. Her sister showed up and after I explained what was going on, she took her away. I felt tremendous relief when they were gone. Life I could finally breath for the first time in seven months. I don't know what I'm looking for here. She must have known this was going to happen. She must have wanted it. She can't possibly be that stupid that she thinks this behavior, these choices she made, would result in anything other than divorce and a broken family. She is beautiful. She is smart. Our marriage was great up until she started her affair. I have accepted that life changes. I have moved past it. Now she is pretending like she loves me? That she wants us to remain married in a family? What could possibly be her motivation to have this major drama at this point? What could she gain? I mean, she couldn't possibly expect us to try to reconcile at this point. Could she? It must be some kind of ploy? I just can't figure out WTF it is? I have lots of evidence of her cheating. I live in a European country, and this would mean no alimony or anything for her. Could that be it? Is she afraid I will out her? Could that be it? She wants me to feel sympathy so I don't tell people about what she did. Her AP is married so maybe she is scared I will her as wife? I just can't get my head around it. Anyway, I just had to get this out of my head. I was hoping it would make more sense typed out. But no, I am just as confused now as when I started this rant. Update, my cheating STBXW confuses the hell out of me. So first of all, thank you to everyone. It's been overwhelming in many ways. I haven't had a chance to answer everyone, but I have tried to read everything. I posted three days after the conversation with my STBXW and I had hardly slept. Actually, I passed out reading messages on my computer. When I woke up the next day I had an interesting keyboard pattern on my face and a much clearer mind. I decided to make some lists, for and against on, on the key points. I put a bunch of papers on the wall I made a headline on each of them. Our kids? How to behave when meeting the wife? My marriage? Monica? Questions to ask my wife? Etc. The final document is too big to retype here, so I will just cover some of the main points. My goal was trying to figure out what core principles I wanted in place and what are the most important things that I wanted to focus on. Then I went through each of those and evaluated whether or not I would actually be able to achieve anything meaningful from it and what would be a meaningful result in the case I got anywhere. As for the kids, they are my number one priority. I will increase my efforts to help them deal with this. More individual counseling, family counseling, I will arrange trips and spend more quality time together and make new memories. I will also involve the rest of the family on my side to drown them in love and help them through this. I will also talk to their teachers, coaches, etc. I want to make sure their support system is immediate and everywhere. I got an SDI test, and I've also booked DNA testing of the kids. Just thinking they might not be mine makes me very uncomfortable, but I have to make sure for their sake. If they're not mine, maybe there is some medical history they need to know about. What if they want to reach out to the real father when they get older? How will they see me if I don't act now to make sure? Hopefully they are mine and I will be stressed until I get it confirmed one way or the other. After talking alone to their therapists first, they joined us and we explain everything carefully and let them ask as many questions as they wanted. I repeated over and over and over again that they could come to me with anything. I am their dad. I love them more than anything and I will always, always be there for them. Whatever they need, no matter what. As for my marriage, I came to the conclusion that I can never trust my wife again. Without trust, it's not possible to have a relationship. I also came to the conclusion that I do not love my wife. I don't love the person she has become. My love for her used a very big part of me, but she killed that with the affair. It totally changed my perception of her. Maybe I could learn to love her again, but to be able to do that, I would have to want that, and TBH, I don't want to. Better to end it and get on with our lives. I no longer want this marriage. I don't want our relationship. I don't don't want her. The part of me that loved her. The part of me that loved her. The part of me that used to feel endless joy and happiness when thinking about her. That now fills me with dread and memories of pain. Actually, any thought of association with her causes me serious discomfort at the moment. Divorce is inevitable, I think. And I want to get it done as soon as possible. 
As for Monica, I talked a lot to her. I had some concerns based on the feedback I had here on Reddit. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea to jump into a new relationship. I also didn't want to bring her into my mess. And let's face it, my life is a total mess at the moment. She disagreed. She said life is messy. Might as well see how we deal with that together while dating. I found out why she never married. She was engaged, actually. Her fiancé died unexpectedly in a work accident almost five years ago. This devastated her, and even though she had gone on a few dates since, she had not been able to form a connection with anyone. From her perspective, life is short, and you have to take risks whenever a true opportunity presents itself. I explain how I don't want to start anything until after the divorce is official. I don't want to cheat while I am technically married. She agrees and respects that. I also talked about how it could be perceived if we all of a sudden were an item out in the open for everyone to see. It would be easy to try to frame her as the homewrecker. I don't want that, she agreed, and we will wait a little bit after it's official until we do anything. I feel incredibly drawn to Monica. This phone call is a borderline emotional affair in my mind so I will not contact her again until I am done with legal separation. We agreed that I would get my affairs in order and contact her when I was ready, and we would see what we do then. When it came to planning the meeting with my wife I wrote down some principles on who I want to be. I would make every effort in my meeting with her to try to be that man, the man I used to be before all this. I decided I needed to stay calm. I would make every effort not to be cruel. I would keep in mind that the purpose of this conversation was to move on with our life. The purpose was to be able to co-parent as good as possible for our kids. Still, I prepared a list of questions to try to understand her thinking to have this affair, and also what she was thinking about moving forward. I was not going to be deceitful. I was not going to give her false hope that there was a chance to reconcile just to get a post-nup or some benefit in divorce. I have decided to act as fairly as possible. I will divide all assets with her equally. We will have 5050 custody. Even though she has acted terribly towards me, I will not use her as a role model. I will act so I can stand by my actions today, tomorrow and twenty years from now. I hate her for what she did to me, what she did to us, to our children, but I love the memories of the good times we had together, while it lasted. And I love our children that we created and raised together. I will try to remember her in this light moving forward, not her cheating. I can't carry hate in my heart so at tea some point I need to forgive her so I can move on. Up until the point she cheated I think we had a very good marriage, we would make love every day. We spent a lot of quality time together. We hardly ever argued. We sacrificed for each other willingly. I was actually very open with her up until I discovered her infidelity. I believed she was open with me as well, but now her actions shows this not to be the case. So Saturday came and I went to see her. Her sister had warned me that she was not in good shape. She was not wrong. My STBXW looked absolutely horrible. Bloodshot eyes, swollen face, unkept hair. She looked many sizes smaller than I remember, like she had imploded into herself. I doubt she has slept or eaten much this week. We all sat down and my wife was shaking almost uncontrollably. I felt surprisingly calm. I felt for her obvious pain, but not as a loving spouse. I felt for her pain like I would feel for an actor in a movie I was engaged in. I don't know how to explain the feeling really. It confirmed that I probably don't love her anymore. I just sat there and waited for her to collect herself enough to speak. She started several times but would break down crying. Watching her it's clear it's not an act. I have seen her cry many times before but never like this. I guess people can fake cry, but I doubt anyone can fake the look of crying nonstop for a week mixed with soul-torturing sobs and giant snot bubbles. When she finally started talking it was like a damn burst. She apologized every second word. Surprisingly she didn't try to excuse herself or shift the blame to me. Her sister cried as well and would from time to time berate her. It also became clear that her sister had warned her this would happen. Apparently it's how her sister lost her fiancé year back. I didn't know that. Her sister's cheating gave my wife a midlife crisis of sorts. She started to think about cheating a lot. In the end it seems she did this because she got infatuated slash a crush on the guy and couldn't help herself. She never believed I would find out. Or that anyone would get hurt. It was a completely selfish thing. She was apparently very happy in our marriage. She convinced herself that she deserves this fling and that I probably supported her choice if I knew how happy she was at the time. She convinced herself that this affair would pass, and we would all go back to living happy family lives ever after. She had no idea I had found out, and only when I started to check out did she start to question what was going on. I learned she broke up with the AP about 1.5 months ago. The buzz had started to wear off. She gave me her phone to check and she had blocked him. When I unblocked him, messages dating back one and a half months started pouring in. 
She had been trying to re-engage me in our marriage, but I hadn't shown any interest of having anything to do with her. Up until I sat her down, she was convinced that we would be able to find a way back together and that we would end up stronger than ever. When she looked into my eyes when I confronted her, she understood that this was probably the end of the line. The reality of it all hit her like a ton of bricks. I tried asking her some questions, primarily about what it was in her mind that gave her the right to do this to us, to our children. Basically, it's nothing but selfishness on her part. I realized, like so many of you pointed out, I will never get the answers that I'm looking for because they don't exist. There is no acceptable reason for cheating, therefore I will never get an acceptable answer. I did, however, get closure in a weird way. I got to explain to her how badly she had hurt me, the incredible pain she had caused. I got her to accept that it's her fault that our marriage is broken and that our children will grow up in a broken home. This gave me a strange feeling of peace. She had been reading everything she could about fixing a broken marriage after infidelity. She had a complete timeline and detailed confession signed and everything ready for me. I haven't read it, I just gave it to my lawyer. She begged and begged and begged and begged for a second chance. She would do anything she said. I told her I didn't believe her. In fact, I didn't believe anything she said. I just don't trust her. She asked me what she could do to fix it. I told her she broke it. If she doesn't know how con she expect me to present her with a solution. I asked her if she was in my shoes, what would she answer to that? If anything? These types of questions went back and forth for a while. In the end, she conceded that had the roles been reversed, she probably wouldn't forgive this either. I told her I had gotten an SDI test and that I would a DNA test the kids. She completely broke down for about 20 minutes when she heard this. She insisted that this was the only time she had ever cheated or done anything out of line. Again, after some back and forth, she conceded that I had no reason to believe her and if she was in my shoes, she would probably do the same. I asked her if AP's wife knew. She didn't know. She conceded that she deserved to know. I asked her if she should tell her or should I? She asked me if I would consider reconciling or marriage counseling if she told her. I told her no, but I said it would help her regain a tiny bit of respect in my eyes. She promised to tell the AP's wife and everybody else she would go to HR as well and confess everything. Again, I told her I don't really believe her. She swore she would never be with anyone else and that she would never give up on getting back with me, even if it took the rest of her life. I didn't believe her, but I didn't say anything. It was getting redundant at this point. She offered me a one-sided open marriage, access to all her communication, 247 availability. I told her that I had talked to Monica and that I am waiting because I don't want to cheat. I don't want to cheat. I don't want to be in an open relationship. It would hurt her if we did that, and I don't want to hurt other people like she hurt me. I don't want to be her jailer either. Constantly snooping on her and being suspicious isn't grounds for a heathy relationship. I am not interested in intimacy without a deeper connection either. Sex for the sake of mechanical sex has no value for me. If I need mechanical release can fix that on my own. I don't need a partner for that. At this point we were all exhausted, we had been going out for over five hours, and my wife had been crying on a scale from bad to absolutely horrifying almost the entire time. We weren't going to get any further on this, it was done. I told her very clearly that the love I used to have for her had died. I didn't recognize the person she had become anymore. Our family had died by her hand and that I would go through with divorce. I told her she could not undo what she has done. The only way to avoid this result would have been to not start the affair seven months ago. I didn't want our marriage back. I didn't want her back. I did not want more pain. I suggested we go no contact for a while to get some distance and perspective. I told her I already filed and that my mind was made up. We could start family therapy to co-parent, but beyond that I don't even want to see her. This was incredibly painful to tell her. She was crying hard while mumbling no, 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 please no, please no. When I got up to leave she got a massive, almost explosive nosebleed. She started to reach for me, but she passed out. I managed to catch her before she hit the floor. I drove her and her sister to the ER and stayed until I learned she would be okay. Last night and today STBXW has been telling everyone what she has done. The AP's wife called me this morning to get confirmation that what my wife had told her was true. I sent her copies of some of the evidence. I just learned she kicked her husband out. She wants to meet and look at more of the evidence. She has been suspecting for a long time but haven't had anything solid. I suggested we sit down for dinner tomorrow. She had a need to talk and asked if we could talk on the phone. I don't know if I can take that on right now. I told her maybe later. I freely admit I am feeling feeling like a piece of S. I haven't been able to sleep. Cracks are forming in my resolve. I know I must stay strong, but it's very hard. Why do I feel so guilty? Why do I feel responsible to try to fix this? We may be able to fool ourselves for a while, 
but it will most likely not work long term. Some of her friends and relatives have been calling me up and cursing me out. They think I should give her a second chance, but in my mind I am thinking, why drag out the pain? Better to get it over with so we can start to heal and build new lives. So that's it, nothing spectacular, no revenge, no resolve, no peace. No happy ending, just more pain for all of us. My mind is in a very dark place right now. I don't know what to do, to be honest. 